Miguel Literati back here on the MMA Museum podcast, and I am joined by my friend and partner, Todd Atkins, and uh, we are joined by Bob Maisie. Bob Maisie is the lawyer involved in the uh, lawsuit against the UFC, you know, on behalf of the fighters. I think he's got over 1,100 fighters in the, in the package you know, that are, uh, you know, uh, suing the UFC, and this is lawsuit's been going on now for about a decade. There was some progress made. We spoke to him about uh, a couple of weeks ago on Todd's podcast, and I want to have him back to the MMA Museum so we can document some stuff. Bob, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Just back from Japan. Good, good. Good for you. Guys. Enjoy your trip and uh, come back to see ugly Todd and I. So I apologize for that. But uh, you're doing some important stuff here. We got from you that the UFC... Uh, and yourselves are going to be moving this lawsuit forward quickly, that the judge made a decision that sometime by April of next year that there will be action in court. Is that correct? And I believe we got a trial date, and I could be wrong, but I, I'm going from memory. I believe it's April 9th. We, we got scheduled. That's our trial date. Okay, so fantastic. So something... After 10 years, something has uh, has moved forward. Why don't you take this back? Because uh, in Todd's podcast, you mentioned uh, some of your background. You mentioned that uh, you and your brother came from baseball and that that gave you uh, an idea of how major sports are run and the financing and things. And then you showed up at a UFC and something was fishy, just to, you know, the eyeball test. And uh, I'd like for you to mention it. Take us through the conversation with Carlos Newton that made you uh, really firmly file, you know, file a lawsuit. So around 2008 or 2009, I, I wrote a series of articles on the Ali Act that I posted on the MMAFA.tv website. Some of uh, the other sites uh, picked those articles up. So those were circulating. W one of the writing devices that I used in those articles is the Ali Act, there, there was legislative findings, and they're, they're right at the beginning of the act. Congress finds makes the following findings with regards to boxing. And it was basically A, B, C, D, E, and F, six things. So I took that, and I just switched out boxer or boxing and put in mixed martial arts or mixed martial artists, put, put it right in the article. And that, at the very you know end in a footnote, I say... I took those directly from the act and I just switched two words. The findings applied almost verbatim. Carlos saw that article. So in 2000, I believe it was 2011, I get asked to be uh, the keynote speaker at West Virginia Law School in regards to uh, what's going on in mixed martial arts. I gave a presentation. The presentation, I believe, was circulated again. Some media sites picked it up. Uh, Carlos saw that. At the end of that West Virginia presentation, one of the professors asked me, how, how come there hasn't been an antitrust suit? And my, my response to that question was, because I don't have a plaintiff yet. And, had, you know, had I thought about it, when sort of the initial generation of fighters got to the end of their careers, that would have been my first batch of plaintiffs. So that's pretty much exactly what happened. Um, you know, the guys that came up from 2001 to 2005, by the time 2014 came, were at the end of their careers or finished. Uh, they became the initial plaintiffs. So Carlos sees those presentations, sees those articles, talks to some people, uh, gets my number and calls. And his call was essentially, um, if I come to Arizona, can we meet up? And I'm thinking, sure, yeah, I'll meet with you. <laughs> you know, thinking he wants to go out to dinner or something. So, uh, well, my, my initial thought was, this is something I'd heard, you know, all the time. So I, I wasn't expecting him to actually come to Arizona in the first place. He he calls, he's got a fight for like two weeks later. I'm like, wow, he's, he is serious. So I was like, yeah, sure. Well, I'll meet up. He gets into town. He wants me to pick him up uh, in the morning, take him to my law office and then bring him home at dinner time all week for the entire week. <laughs> I'm like, this is really weird. Uh, he, had, he had me put him in a conference room, asked for my Westlaw password, and he sat in the, the conference room basically pulling cases for days. 
So by the third day, you know, I have an idea as to why he's there. I have an idea as to why he wants to speak to me, but he hasn't said anything yet. So I take him to a baseball game and I'm like, uh, Hey, Carlos, what are we doing here, man? And Carlos laughed. He goes, I know you figured this out, Macy. You're going to file an antitrust suit. And I was like, I'm a real estate lawyer. So I don't care. You, <laughs> you're you going to end up filing it. So we, we did. We started uh, working on it the next day. That would have been like March of 2012. And I actually missed this, I believe, on on uh, Todd's podcast. I, for whatever reason, I conflated the time period. It took us over two and a half years from the day we started to, to filing, to get it filed. So we started um, March of 2012, ended up getting it filed in December of 2014. Okay. Now you mentioned so, sort of a, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, just a little aside. Um, one thing not many people know is antitrust by statute looks back four years from the date of filing. So it's pegged to our filing date. That filing date took you know, a substantial period of time. So there was fighters that I was talking to in the interim that didn't make the complaint because they became cold. Mm -hmm. uh, that was tough, you know, um, having to tell guys that we just, you know, I didn't get it done fast enough. That that was kind of heartbreaking at times. Um, you know, some guys had nine, 10 fights between 2008, 2009, early 2010. They just didn't make, you know, they're, they were told. Um, so when you see me at the initial press conference, I'm remembering, you know, these guys were on the complaint or are going to be on the complaint. Didn't make it because they, we just didn't get it done fast enough. So that was, that was tough. And and how many fighters are you, you gave a number, I think it's 1100 something. What, what's the exact number there? I believe it's 1,215 that are, okay. that are in uh, the league class. And when I say Lee, we, we filed two cases. So the first one is the the Lee case. That's uh, Kung Lee, um, Nate Quarry, John Fitch, Brandon Vera, Kyle Kingsbury, and Javi Vasquez. And then just so we didn't have a time period gap, we filed essentially the identical suit in uh, June of 2021 with Cajun Johnson and C.B. Dalloway. And that's just, you know, to bring the case from June 30th, 2017, which is where the Lee case ended, uh, forward to the present. So there's no time gap. And the, the reason the Lee case ended at that date is not because it had to. It was we didn't have any more data to give our economists past that date. So when the, you know, the expert economist is modeling uh, impact and damages, he he basically said the class period ends as of June 30th, 2017, because I don't have any more data. So our fix was to file the second case. Okay. Now, take us back to, uh, I heard a story from you where uh, you actually went to a UFC and you start saying, okay, you know, the light is probably spending about this and it didn't add up to you. Take us through that moment for you, that watershed moment where you realized you, you had something there. So th that would have been UFC 44. Uh, I was training uh, at 10th Planet, which is Eddie Bravo's gym that he just opened in Los Angeles uh, following his grappling victory over Hoyler Gracie, which at that time was an enormous upset. I kind of put Eddie on the map. He opens his gym very soon after. And within like, I want to say I, I started there about three months after he opened. I was at that gym. So about four Maybe four months later, um, we call them teammates. You know, one of our teammates gets asked to fight Josh Thompson on the undercard of USC 44. So people in the gym were like, hey, let's let's drive out. We'll get tickets, uh, share hotel, hotel rooms, drive out, go watch the fights. I hadn't been to an event before then. Um, so, yeah, sure. So we drive out. We go to the show. And at that time, um, the lower bowl – would be largely full from the first prelim on, which is the exact opposite of what you'll see now. And, and at that time, this would have been, I want to say it was like April of 04 or, or 03, I'm sorry. It's around there. At that time, um, I think the lower bowl, bowls were largely full because gyms like us would drive out and go to the shows. We, we weren't priced out. 
we could still get tickets for fifty, seventy-five dollars. You know, right on the side, six rows up from the cage. Um, and you knew they were gyms because they'd have their T-shirts on. You know, fifteen of them wearing the same shirt. Um, talking to them. Uh, I went to a, a BJ Penn Matt Hughes fight. Guys from BJ Penn's camp are jumping on her back <laughs> when when he got the win over Hughes. Um, but that first show, you know, I'm just started looking around and it hadn't dawned on me yet that there was a problem until after Gerald's fight, after his fight, uh, against Josh Thompson, he loses in the first round. He comes out and he, he's asking to borrow money to get home to Oregon. And I'm like, what? So I, I, right away, I'm like looking around. I'm like, there's 15,000 people here. I'm starting to do calculations right away the concession lines would be literally 50 deep uh, to buy posters or t-shirts or, you know, whatever they were selling um, packed. It was packed. Um, so I get back to the gym and I'm like, I don't really understand that. Why was Gerald borrowing money to get home? I first, first time I'm, I'm told uh, purses are two and two at that time, 2000 to fight, 2000 to win. Gerald's got to do brain scan. He's got to get medicals. He probably flew out a corner. He's got to get an extra hotel room because they only fly out one. They only give you one extra hotel room. Um, so like literally at that time, and this is probably true through the mid 2000s for a lot of guys, they're actually paying to fight in the UFC. Um, yeah. So I, I, I started, you know, coming coming up with calculations and over time, I was getting closer and closer to, to very accurate. Um, sort of the, the next piece for me was I had to figure out because the, the in arena stuff, I, I had a good, pretty good grasp on, I thought, um, including sponsors. I could figure that out. Um, what I didn't know is I had no idea what these things were selling on pay-per-view. So I started following uh, Dave Melser. I got the wrestling observer for years. Uh, D Dave would publish estimates um, that he was getting from basically his carrier sources um which you know gave me one extra piece to sort of put into to my models and then around 2011 or 12 um espn did a story with josh gross um where on the fighter side it was me ken shamrock somebody I'm forgetting and then uh, they also did a, a lengthy piece with Lorenzo Fertitta um, after that interview aired I, I learned sort of the final piece that I, that I was not aware of and that was the usage of um, letters of agreement which, which is basically a side letter given to starfighters um, in place of pay-per-view bonus so Somebody might have a side letter to where instead of getting pay-per-view split at 200,000 buys, they kick it up to, it doesn't kick in until $750,000 or 750,000 buys. But in exchange, they get an extra four or 5 million uh, up front as a guarantee. They're giving up sort of back-end pay-per-view for an upfront uh, fee, and they put this in a side letter. There, there's all kinds of reasons as to why they were doing it that way. Uh, first and uh, probably primarily because they didn't want it reported anywhere. Um, that was sort of the last piece of the pay puzzle that I didn't have until after that broadcast. Um, some, some people called me and told me. Um, and then once I had that final piece, there, there was at that time um, a few different pay splits had, had become public through litigation, I believe. They were, they were published or Randy Couture's was published as a result of a press conference. Somebody took a photo of it, uh, so it was reported. So I had a, a couple of pay-per-view splits. I knew I now knew about the letters of agreement. I could put those into the model. The, the model that I was doing back in 2012 to entice these prominent national class action firms to come into the case with me ended up being very, very close to accurate. Uh, you know, just kind of using boxing as a yardstick and coming up with my estimates as to what these shows were generating and what they were paying out um, and what they would be paying out if it was competitive like boxing. 
Now, you mentioned, uh, for example, being at the show and seeing uh, the concessions 50 people deep. How, you know, I've done some shows, but obviously on a smaller end. How does the UFC even get involved in that? Because sometimes they get, the arena keeps that, you know? How do they get a bite of that in, 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 their, in their contracts and stuff? Because now they're beginning to act like a mafia in that they're grabbing a little bite of everything they can. The, you know, the sponsors, a bite. The uh, concessions, a bite. The parking, a bite. All that is kind of like that type of, you know, shady activity where they're involved in everything. How, how could you be sure that they were getting the concession money? When I when I when I'm talking about concessions, I was talking about shirts, posters, oh. uh, trading cards, gloves, all UFC branded stuff. I wasn't talking food and beer. Now, okay. now, um, I don't. I, I'm not certain if the UFC gets, you know, food and beer or not, or if they pay a flat fee and, or you know some sort of percentage of sales. I don't know how how they're allocating that. I I know unboxing. Uh, I, I believe, in fact, I believe Jake Paul just did this as well, but like Floyd, Floyd will actually contract out all of those services and pay a rate and then anything over he gets everything, everything involved with his event goes through Floyd. Mike Tyson get, gave an interview. I, I tweeted this out a couple of weeks ago in that interview, Tyson says, why is it somebody's getting a check? from my fight and then cutting me a check. That's my money. I pay you. Everybody goes through the fighter. He's right. That's how it works in sport. Everyone would be hired by the fighter, including the promoter. Promoter works for the fighter. In in this sport, because it's not operated as a sport, the UFC has been enabled to function like a reality show while selling their product to the public as sport. This is the only one, just UFC. And then it's a recipe for monopoly. What they did um, results in exactly what occurred. If you eliminate horizontal competition, which they did right from the start, they were never going to co-promote. They only did once. And that was to, uh, in my opinion, hasten the demise of pride. It backfired on them because Chuck lost, <laughs> um, but they, they were never going to co-promote and they were dictating ascension to title because they controlled rank. What sport does the producer of the event control ascension? None, none. Result dictates. If John Fitch is this number one ranked contender, for a period of five years, I don't care if you like him. I don't care if you hate wrestlers. He gets a title shot. Not in the UFC. They have to bestow that right upon you. They have to tell you we're going to let you fight for the title. And lo and behold, what happens? As fighters move up the ranks in the UFC, their contract length gets longer. Why? Because you don't move up unless you sign extensions. You don't get title fights unless you sign lengthy extensions. Um, for the public watching, when you hear Dan White say, so-and-so is not ready yet, what he's actually saying is they haven't signed their extension yet. So I'm not giving them a title fight. I'm putting them to the side. And he, he does this repeatedly in public where he'll basically play fighters off of each other. You want a title shot? You want a title shot? And of course, the fighters want the title shot because that's where the fame and fortune comes from. You got to win the title. Now, the, the remaining piece for what the UFC accomplished was they had to remove the other titles that mattered to consolidate 1 through 15 in every weight class. That's why you saw them go out and they bought WEC, closed it, bought Strike Force, closed it, bought the assets from WFA. They needed Quentin's contract. Quentin beat Chuck. They couldn't allow him to be outside of the USC. They had to bring him in. Um, yeah. Repeatedly up through 2011. And then in 2011, this came out as part of the antitrust suit. In February of 2011, Joe Silva sends an email to, uh, I believe it was Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. The, the email was literally, he, he went to a 
consensus rate rankings of mixed martial artists. He copied and pasted into the body of his email ranked fighters one through 15 in each of the major weight classes. And then in the subject line, he wrote, we own MMA. And then when you look down at the rankings one through 15, following Strike Force's consolidation, they had virtually every one through 15 in every weight class. So now if I'm if I'm a fighter coming up and I want to make money, and the way you make money is you gain public not notoriety, I have to beat ranked fighters. Well, where are they all? They're all in the UFC. You only have to accomplish that once. Now it's self-perpetuating. I have to go there uh, to be considered really relevant. Yeah, they, they, and you know, a lot of people have been looking at the facts to this. I'm, I'm, you know, a total amateur, but having experienced the UFC's behavior over, you know, the last twenty years, my gut feeling is that if this plays itself out all the way in court that they, they could be found guilty. There's a good chance of it because there's a lot of evidence, as you pointed out, Dana's been in public with a lot of this stuff and behavior brazenly. So let me ask you, as a lawyer, um, when they merge with the WWE, you, you know, that's another powerhouse, another company with, you know, thousands of you know, dollars an hour for lawyers and stuff like that. And you would think that they would look at this, assess it, if they assess it the way we do, where it's like, oh, the UFC might really have a problem here. They might not have gone ahead with it. Now they've gone ahead and they did the merger. What does that do to your lawsuit, the involvement of the WWE? And then I'll ask a follow-up question on that. Because their lawyers would would have to have okayed on this. Or or it's not possible that they didn't know about the lawsuit merge. And then it's like, oh, that was there? So... Please explain how like, how you react to that merger. Well, that's a good question. In fact, uh, people on our team asked the same question. This was discussed. Our view, and if, if you read our complaint, this is right in the com our initial complaint that we filed in 2014, is the, the WWE is not in the same market as the UFC. It's just not, it's not, it's not a, uh, a comparable product. It is not, you know, re uh, a replacement for an athlete that, that would essentially be like telling an athlete you can't compete in a sport but you can go act it in a play and, and calling it the same thing that is not the same thing to an athlete so we, we have argued all along that the wwe is a completely separate market altogether um which which i think is is going to prove accurate in fact dana white just criticized Lawrence Epstein in public because Epstein made a comment. We're going to bring all WWE fans over to the UFC and vice versa. And Dana White, correctly so in my view, says that's the stupidest thing he's ever heard. Um, not going to happen. The, the audiences, there's not a lot of crossover in the audiences, in my view. Um, and I think the data is going to prove that out as well. Um, but Really, the simplistic answer is the merger causes us concern, but not between WWE and UFC. I think the practical result we're going to see is you're going to see the agencies eliminated. They're going to disappear. It's going to just be Endeavor representing essentially UFC fighters and WWE entertainers. Uh, throughout their athletic careers and then also when they move on to do you know sort of the house movies the studio movies that wwe is known for um they're going to continue that you know straight from the moment they enter into the ufc through their entire entertainment career they're going to represent them um and as evidence of that when endeavor bought the ufc very soon after CAA drops their mixed martial arts division, it's gone. That's not a coincidence in my view. CAA knows we can't effectively represent fighters negotiating with our arch rival WME, who now owns the UFC. What they do, they they exited, they they left. Um, that is ultimately going to end up, uh, in my opinion, hurting athletes and entertainers because their their options are going to be limited um and there's going to be conflicts of interest for sure 
Okay. Now, like I said, I'm an amateur and I'm not a lawyer, but I remember a, a long time ago that Citibank and Travelers Group merged. There was a big merger and it was very controversial at the time because one was an insurance company and one was a bank and there was legislation that both actively worked to change so that the merger could be approved. It wasn't even legal before they actually changed that. And one of the claims they made afterwards was that now it's not a bank, it's not an insurance company, we're something else, we're something bigger. Could the UFC and the WWE claim that, like to be beyond sport kind of thing? And, and let me add another component here. What if, because they've got $15 billion, what if the next component was to buy matchroom boxing or top rank boxing? Spend $5 billion on, on one of those companies, and now you've got boxing added to the milieu of what they present. It confuses things, like you said. They, they control more, but they can make a claim to be something completely different than the PFL. You know, the PFL is down there small, and we're this huge entertainment sports combat company. Does, is that a worry in some fashion, especially with a, a boxing merger, which I speculated about from the very beginning? I thought that they, they would announce that within the next year that that was going to happen. Maybe not, but what would that do to you? That was a lot of questions in one. Uh, the The interesting, yeah, the interesting part of of what you asked about is directly related to the Ali Act, and, and that is why haven't they taken over a boxing promoter? And, and the answer is very, very simple. Dana White, in fact, basically admits this in public. He, they haven't taken over a boxing promoter because they can't monopolize boxing. They can't. Why? Because in boxing, the promoters don't control rank and title which leads you to Floyd Mayweather. Floyd can go to his promoter, Bob Arum, and say, you think I'm a little guy? You think I'm boring? I'm going to buy myself out of my contract. Here's $800,000. Let me go. And, and Aram said, sure, kid, go go kill you. Go, knock yourself out. Took the 800000 Floyd made over $300 million in his career because he didn't need Aram to get a belt. He could get the belt no matter who promoted him, including himself, which is what he did. And by promoting himself, that literally means he gets up, walks to the other side of the table and says, now I'm hiring you. It's the exact same people involved. It's just, where's the money go first? Now all goes through Floyd. That's why the Ali Act works. If you separate rank and title from promoter, the promoter can't monopolize the industry. They can't. It's too expensive. And that's why you haven't seen the UFC actively trying to take over top rank or um, match room or, or um, the Bella entertainment, any of those, They're they can't boxing. lock it down. Yeah. They, they can't lock it down like they did MMA because they can't control rank and title. Now, and this is my opinion. My opinion is Lorenzo Fertitta knew this right from the start. He knew this back in 2000. The Ali Act was passed in 2000, May of 2000, I believe it was signed into law. The act at that time just said boxer. So what, what does Lorenzo do? Lorenzo was on the Nevada State Athletic Commission when the Ali Act was passed. He leaves the Nevada State Athletic Commission six months later by Zufa. With the goal, we're going to own a sport. What's the difference? Well, they basically do what is explicitly illegal in boxing in MMA. They operate MMA, again, as a reality show, not a sport, control a sanction, and with that control, they dictate what you have to sign. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the circumstantial evidence I saw during the uh, negotiations with Ngannou. And Dana, again, because he you know, speaks freely and, and doesn't really give a crap, sort of hinted at, like, um, you know, that the negotiations weren't going well for Ngannou and stuff like that. And I believe that that was where the he may have been actively looking, like, what would have happened to Ngannou if Dana had stepped in and purchased top rank? Because Bob, that Bob Arum is one of Tyson Fury's promoters. Then that fight would never have materialized and Dana would be involved again. And that's where I thought their tentacles were spreading in. But... Um, the, the Ali Act that provides the, the boxing, the Queen's very rules, some protection is what you're saying. The Ali Act works because it is incredibly simple and it, it, it mandates a certain structure. 
and it's almost self-enforcing. That's why you don't see many cases on this. You don't you don't see uh, PBC putting up PBC title. It, it's, it doesn't happen. I, I think boxers at this point in time also realize that would be nonsensical and they would never they would never go for that. They know my my money is tied to me being able to shop myself around and promoter controlled title with exclusive contracts terminates all of that. It locks in locks you into one promoter competing for just that promoter's belt. Now it's just a matter of time. And what took time was the UFC had to eliminate the other titles until theirs was the only one that mattered. That's exactly what happened. Pride. Pride, back in the early 2000s, um, to hardcore fans, I, I think we thought Pride had the better fighters and was a bigger event. Um, they got taken over in 2008, closed. Fighters brought over into the UFC. Um, very intentionally. In fact, some of these purchases, this again came out through the Antitrust Act, the UFC was making some of these purchases not because it was good for their business or added to their, uh, you know, enterprise. It, it was defensive. It was to make sure nobody else had access to that pool of fighters, and they would they they would also do some of these purchases with limited diligence. Meaning, you know, if I have, typically if you're spending millions and millions of dollars to acquire a company, you're going to know everything about that company ahead of time. You'll know exactly what their contracts say, exactly what all the liabilities are. The UFC was making some of these bids, basically foregoing proper diligence because they wanted to close quickly. Um, they were willing to pay more money to make sure nobody else bid, it went to them. Nobody else. And then you have Lorenzo Fertitta making comments. Um, what was your... Who were you referring to when you were saying we got to choke the oxygen out of these fuckers? <laughs> Lorenzo says, I believe we were talking about Bellator. Well, what were you referring to when with oxygen? What, what did you mean by oxygen? Uh, fighters. We got to deprive them of access to relevant fighters. So they disappear. <clears throat> Ultimately, that that's, is what happened. Um, the Ali Act, because it divorces title from promotion just structurally doesn't allow for that to occur. There, there's no incentive to go out and gobble all these promoters up and close them down because fighters, when they obtain title can just leave you and start their own promotion. That's what Francis would be doing. If he was a boxer, if he was a boxer, Francis's next fight would be against John Jones in Cowboy stadium. And they'd probably make $45 million each. And Gano 45 and Jones 45. Instead, what happened? Lo and behold, as soon as Francis becomes a free agent, he's stripped of title. Jones is named interim champ in the UFC. It, I'm of the opinion and that Jones was being negotiated with before Francis left, and he was being made offers. So in the event that Francis wasn't re-signed, they had their new champ, Jones. <laughs> yeah, already this should that. never be allowed. I mean, you are, you're making a mockery of sport by stripping Francis. He didn't lose. And you're also depriving fans of the biggest fight that can be made in MMA now, Francis versus John. What, yeah. what is goofy to us is... Uh, a, a typical response to that that we get is, well, Francis could have resigned with the UFC. Why would he have to? Why should he be forced to sign with one promotion to compete for a title? That would be the equivalent of the Dallas Cowboys putting up the Cowboys Cup and then saying to other teams, if you want to compete for the Cowboys Cup, you have to sign exclusive deals with just us. And oh, by the way, we determine who's on the field. That would be ludicrous to everybody. Everyone would realize how insane that is. That's not sport, but that is literally exactly what happens uh, with the UFC. That is what is happening in MMA. Okay. So what worries me about all of this, including with the WWE merger, is that now this new company is, you know, been valued at $15 billion. So if, if we do, like, 
a little bit of basic math. Uh, you have 1,200 fighters in the lawsuit. If I wanted to average a million dollar payout to the fighters, all I need is $1.2 billion. I mean, they have that. So what if they come with an offer, a monetary offer that does not include a change of practice in the business? Um, you know, philosophically, I think everybody at the beginning of the lawsuit would agree, of course, they got to change their business practices. That's why we're here in the first place. But again, money, you know, you have you may have a fighter in need that says my payout's gonna be, you know, eight hundred thousand from this. I, I want that now, I want to settle now. How do you avoid that pressure? Is and is the change of practices a showstopper for you in the lawsuit? We have a group of named plaintiffs um, from the very beginning has stressed how important injunctive relief is to them. I, I don't think they are going to accept just a monetary award with no change. I, I don't foresee that happening at all. Um, ultimately, whatever happens is, is going to have to be approved by the judge. It's not, you know, the attorneys or the named plaintiff reps that control Um you know, obviously we, we can reach an agreement and then submit it to the judge for or submit it to the court for court approval. Um, but I, I do believe there's going to have to be some sort of injunctive portion um, uh, of any agreement um, to, to be palatable to, to our plaintiffs. Now, the, the one thing that I left out, um, jumping back to Francis Ngannou, Francis Ngannou was only a free agent because he had a sunset clause put into his promotional agreement as a result of our lawsuit. And that's, that's not conjecture. We're not guessing that that that's a fact. Um, the, the UFC for a period of time put in a sunset clause, meaning in the, in the past, if Francis had a fight left, he'd still owe them a fight 30 years from now. They could just enjoin him from competing anywhere else and say, no, you owe us a fight or they could pull him through injuries, or they'd offer him fights they knew he would say no to. And when he said no, they told him. These are all the tricks they did for years with everybody else. Well, Francis realized, I have a sunset clause. My, my promotional agreement, I believe he signed his around 2017. He knew five years from the date of his signing, my promotional agreement ends no matter what. So to his credit, he was gaming the end of his career to leave UFC with that belt. What, what is really irritating to us is, so he, he's a, a world-class mixed, mar mixed martial artist. He's the heavyweight champ in the UFC. He didn't lose that belt. He got stripped. His next fight is going to be against a world-class boxer, a sport he does not excel at. He's not... Uh, a world champion in boxing. In fact, he hasn't had a pro boxing bout. Why does that? Why is that his next fight? He he could and should be making that same money fighting John Jones. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 it's it's scary to think that uh, um, the UFC has locked everything down that way. That it, since 2017, he was smart enough to get that clause in there, but because. We've heard it from dozens of fighters. There is no, no he, negotiating he, he, with the UFC. He, he didn't, yeah, no, no. He he didn't get that in his contract. They inserted that provision in all the promotional agreements during that time period as a response to our suit. They wanted to go back to the court and say, plaintiffs are saying our contracts last forever. That's not true. We have the sunset clause. Well, after Francis used his sunset clause, and so did Paulo Costa. Paolo used his to negotiate a new deal with the UFC, but he used it. They took him away. Now the sunset clauses are no longer in the contracts. Crazy. <laughs> I want to something. Here, here's something. the problem. Oh, Here, here's the problem Francis is going to have. So, so he, he leaves the UFC. He's got a big fight against Tyson Fury. He's going to make a ton of money, probably more than he's made in his entire career, doing a sport he's never done professionally against – a world champion that's not only dangerous it's sort of uh pointless uh, in a sporting aspect sense in that you know his next fight should be against 
the top ranked mixed martial artist at the heavyweight division, which would be John Jones. Not only does he not get that fight, what relevant fight can they make for, with Francis Ngannou in MMA that would sell on pay per view? Yeah, an opponent. Yeah, and that's that's what I've said all along. It's Tyson Fury is the monetizing opponent, and after that, there is nobody else who's a better opponent than John Jones, and that's you know the the preventative measure there. So you're yeah, you're absolutely right. Their tentacles are are, are very powerful. Um. The uh, Todd, you had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I I wasn't able to ask this because it hadn't happened at the time we did the interview. But since then, as part of the UFC's appeal, they had to admit that fighters only getting I think 13 percent of the revenue, right? You know, John Nash reported, um, I believe 2022, he had them under 14 percent. Yes. So I just wanted your opinion on that. You know, uh, reveal. You know that means. On the on the wage share, yeah. Uh, to so I mean go go back to econ one hundred and one. You know high high school econ. Essentially, the the whole theory of economics is if I start a business and my profit margins are huge, competition will come in and erode those profit margins, right? Because now now I have to compete with somebody else putting out the same product. Those profit margins should decrease. Well, we're seeing the exact opposite with the UFC. Over time, their share is growing, even as revenues skyrocket. Doesn't that make it a, you know, blatantly obvious to everyone this isn't a comp competitive market? Because if it was competitive, their margins would shrink. They're expanding. They're taking more. <laughs> their revenues are going up. This is makes no economic sense other than they're exercising monopoly power. It's blatantly obvious. So with, with that in mind, and that's always been their goal, why did they go through the whole drama with Nganu? And why didn't they go the option? Because with Connor, they actually co-promoted. And, you know, they say Connor made 100 million. They say Floyd made his, you know, 100 million plus. And they say the UFC got 100 million. Like it was a three-way split. I don't know if that's exact. But Dana grabbed a bite of that, and he was front and center in every promotion of that, you know. And he, this gives a good example of why the PFL really seems like a lower league to me. The, the, the Tyson Fury and Ganu press conferences went down. There was absolutely zero presence of the PFL there or anything like that, which I think they dropped the ball. But why didn't Dana, you know, also Dana is on record. I think this week I heard him say, I hate Bob Aaron. So that's another reason why I think he's, he was trying to get involved in the fight and he got blocked out for us. Why didn't that work out for him? What, what is your speculation on that? Because they already did the, you know, the the BS match, the 1-0 and guy or the 0-0 guy versus the champion, and they made huge money for it. Why didn't they try it again with Ngannou? They did try. Oh, I think they did. I, I think Ngannou's people were like, we're not cutting you in on half. No. Okay. <laughs> Which, I mean, honestly, we would advise Connor to do what Nganu did. We, we would advise Connor. There, there was various um, legal things that we, we could have done with Connor uh, with a boxing license in California that he wouldn't have had to split anything with the UFC. He could have put them in a position where the UFC would have been at risk of an adverse decision uh, related to a boxing license and their promotional agreements. And I, I think the result would have been Connor could have done that Floyd fight on his own without the UFC. Now, I, I don't have proof of this, but I suspect what happened with Connor is I think I think his pay got spread out over his next four to six fights in the UFC. And by that I mean he was probably told something like, you'll you'll get your 125 million, Connor. But not all at once. You're going to get a $25 million bonus each of your next five fights. I think they split it up to make sure he stayed with the UFC. Um, now, again, our view is what the, the UFC's promotional agreements on their face violate the Ali Act. He could have and he could have done what uh, Francis did 
and done that fight on his own without cutting the UFC in. Because, I mean, at, at the end of the day, what did the UFC do other than assert their contractual rights over Conor McGregor as a boxer, even though their promotional agreements are illegal <laughs> under boxing law, to take a third? I mean, that's gross <laughs> in our view. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. Now, um, you know, let's let's stick with Connor and another name I want to bring up here with, with the big monetizations out there. The UFC sticks these clauses in now where the, the, I think uh, Todd referred to as a 360 clause, where no matter where you're involved in, they can grab the money. So um, with Connor, is Connor at risk that he has to give up some of his whiskey money? And then here's the other big catch. What if Joe Rogan had that 360 clause in his contract as well. Like, could they really go out and tell him, hey, some of that podcast money is ours as well? Is it that powerful what they're doing? Because they won't mess with Rogan, but could they? So so the, the, anyone who's in the past, I don't think this is going to apply to. Going forward, however, whether that clause is enforceable or whether it goes as far as people fear, I don't think it matters. And, and the, the reason I say that is, let, let's say um, Rojas Jr. becomes a, a world champion, megastar, Mexico, United States, um, becomes an international star and, and starts putting out products. Well, when, when he goes to, say, Nike or Adidas or crypto, whatever, whoever it is, to negotiate a deal, they're going to ask him, show me all the contracts you have signed where you are obligated to provide promotional anything. And he's going to turn over to uh, that group's attorneys what he signed with the UFC, and it's going to create doubt. And what that doubt is going to do is instead of now negotiating with Rojas, that outside group is going to call Zufa to see if they can work around that problem that contract's causing. Now, exactly what they wanted, the UFC's in the middle of that negotiation, whether it's legal or not. It's going to cause a problem because me, if I'm representing the crypto guys, I'm going to say this is a problem. We don't know what the result of this is. We could be pouring in millions of dollars thinking it's exclusive with him, and then the UFC puts out an identical product tomorrow using Rojas. That could happen. If I see that, the first call is going to go to Zufa. I got to resolve that. That, that I think, is the intent of the clause. Um, because, I mean, the, the reality is the vast majority of fighters don't have the time or the money to litigate these clauses individually. They don't. <clears throat> Who's the mastermind behind this? Is it the Fertitas? Is it Dana? I mean, you know, uh, because the Fertitas are, are, you know, no longer owning the UFC, but I believe that they monetize still as the house because now they, you've got a new sport where the gambling is in. They are a casino and they're taking in money. You know, they say the house never loses. So they're taking in money and making that. And that, that, that profit is not anywhere in this lawsuit. That's not what you guys are. You're just going to the Endeavor company for, you know, the money being made by the fights. They're still making a fortune off of that. Do you think, is that, could that money be worth it enough for them to keep, you know, doubling down on these problems? You know? That was a few questions as well. Um, so, so the initial masterminds, <laughs> the, the initial masterminds, um, you know, again, in my opinion, it seems obvious to me was uh, Lorenzo um, and in part Dana. It was those two sort of orchestrating everything. Um, Joe Silva comes along as the matchmaker. Uh, I think he, at least early on, sort of understood um, if we control rank, we control ascension, what that does as a result. I think he figured it out. I don't know if he knew right from the beginning, but he quickly learned it. Um, and you can tell just in his correspondence with the agents, he's he's telling them, uh, how they're going to get a title shot or how they have to fight if they want to move up or get promoted. Um, I, again, just things you would not see in sport that just wouldn't happen. Um, 
you, you, you don't see Roger Goodell, um, you know, sending letters to the owner of the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So uh, we don't like 35 rushes a game. That's boring. Start throwing the ball or we're not going to put you in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. Literally, that is exactly what is going on. It's completely crazy. Um, now, in, in terms of are, are the Fertitas making money through gambling? I, I, I'm sure they are, but I'm not sure the amounts are as big as you think. And it's not because a lot of money is not being bet. It's because there are a lot of outlets to bet through. A lot. So, yeah. you know, what percent they're capturing, I have no idea. Um, but I, I don't think there's any... I think there's a scenario where they get back involved in MMA. I don't think it's, wow. you know, given they're, they're out for good. Now, let me ask you, you mentioned Joe Silva. Like to me, you know, when you, if you compare the entity to a mafia, I, I get to Joe Silva who I knew personally back in the day before he was matchmaker as well. Um, I feel like Joe's like the Irish guy in the Italian mob that they only trusted him to a certain extent. And then, yeah, he figured it out and things, but now he rode off into the sunset, grabbed his money and left, and he's quiet. There's nobody. What if he were to break bad on them and, and really tell you the amount of pressure that they uh, that they exerted on him? Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, Joe was, I think, a, a blue-collar type of guy, got his dream job with the UFC, and I think that's what kept him there. It's like he wanted that job and stuff, so... He started to make adjustments, but uh, he was integral to the killing of Monty Cox because it was a conversation between Joe Silva and Monty that Dana caught wind of, and Dana said, we can't have that. And he kind of allowed that to happen, but he was legitimately explaining to Dana the way things were. It's like, you know, Monty is the manager and this, you know, what we're dealing with there. So what if he were to come out and be more vocal about what his experience was. Would, would that benefit you or would that interest you? Because I'm curious. Suppose Joe in our lawsuit. So, so he, he's, he's under oath uh, under, uh, on his deposition in our suit. In fact, um, so some of the evidence that we got through Joe Silva is cited by the judge in our class certification order. Okay. Then that's good news. Now, to me, it seems like, again, just a superficial knowledge um, that they Joe was on a need-to-know basis. Like, the real money coming in, I don't think Joe understood how much money the guys upstairs are making. I think he had his money. I think he, they, you could even give him a cap and say, look, you negotiate any fight up to 50 grand and you bring them, you know, 20, 30, 40, you, you do that and you deal with that. But then once they get higher in that, they got to go to Dana. Like all of that, if, if, if uh, Joe were to reveal that the company was structured that way, that he had limited power and that he wasn't really matchmaking, uh, would that benefit you? Because like I said, I think that they, I think he played, no, he wasn't, he wanted to keep the job. He left when he left because I think there, there was a lot of pressure and he had he had some money, but I don't think that they let him work the way he wanted to work. I feel like he would have uh, directed the fight game in a different way, more more uh, ethically too, because he, at the end of the day, he was a little more simple. I don't think Joe needed a half a billion dollars to walk away. You know, I think he was just more of a guy that got his dream job and was playing there, but I think he's the key to a lot of their behavior because they would have had to let him know where the lines are. Yes. Um, pretty obviously, I don't know if they had a set cap with Joe, um, but there, there were, it appeared to be always a handful of stars who would negotiate directly with Lorenzo. It wouldn't be with Joe. Joe, for the vast majority of them, handled all of them until they brought on Sean Shelby. And then while, while Joe was still there, Shelby was doing essentially the 135s and below in some of the, the women's divisions. And then Joe would be 145 and up. Um, that was sort of how they split it up. Um, for the vast majority of fighters, they, they never dealt with anyone but Joe. 
you know, so, sometimes they would get an email from one of the attorneys, Mersh, or uh, the paralegal Tracy Long, but the the de the deal that was you know in quotes negotiated, they weren't negotiated. That this is formulaic coming from from Joe. <clears throat> So you think he, he he kind of played along from the very beginning? I don't know how quickly uh, Joe figured it out. I suspect he sort of knew right from the beginning. He definitely knew by 2011. No, no, no question at all. Um, I think he knew well before then, though. Yes. He was in a powerful position at one point with the company because he was the highest executive from the old company to the Zufa company that came over. There was nobody, you know, Art Dave, there was no John Peretti. None of those guys became involved. I've heard a rumor that um, the Fertitas were close with John Lewis, the fighter, and that he may have been offered Dana's spot first. And that, that that's an interesting speculation on how things would have gone there. Um, have you heard anything like that? Or, or John Lewis supposedly walked away because he just wanted to matchmake and they had to keep Joe. There was no other choice. I have not heard that. Um, although it wouldn't surprise me because I, I know John was very sort of well connected um, in, in the in the fight industry at the time. Um, so I, I think it's possible. Okay. So take us take us to April. Uh when the lawsuit starts, how long do you think you guys are going to be in court? Uh, you know, if they dig their heels in and, and the court process has to play itself out. I think the judge has in mind that it's going to be four to five weeks long, four to five week trial. Okay. Wow. That's very fast. Huh? Um, how do you suspect the UFC is going to try to interfere with that? Or can they, do they have any recourse besides maybe offering a big settlement and, and we talked about a million dollars ahead in the settlement. I mean, what if that was three or four million? Like, you know, the minimum guy, the guy who fought once or twice or three times in that period is going to take home three, four hundred thousand. And then the other guys all get, you know, three, four million. And, and Zufa is going to be out or Endeavor is going to be out four billion dollars. But that settles the whole thing. Does that complicate things for you? Not at all. Um if they want to settle for a big enough amount that's acceptable uh, to the to the fighters and agree to some sort of injunctive relief, that that that's a good result. Um, what can UFC do to delay trial? R really, their last shot is the appeal uh, of class certification with the Ninth Circuit. They they filed that appeal. I want to say about three weeks ago, maybe four. We should know by the end of the year, whether the Ninth Circuit is going to hear that appeal or not. Um, so if the Ninth Circuit just says denied or, um, you know, declines to accept that appeal, we're, we're on for April 9th. Um, I, I don't I don't see the UFC being able to do anything to to stall that out other than they either settle with us or, yeah, we'll go go through the trial. Now, you had mentioned at some point that uh, in the UFC's, you know, ever-changing contracts that uh, they had taken a, a stance of, of moving people away from suing them in court, like in breach of contract or whatever, the fighters, and actually going to an arbitration type of thing. Does that scare you in any way? Is there is Because I think the court situation plays itself out, and that's uh, more predictable than an arbitrator in Vegas that could decide either way. How how would you react to some type of call for arbitration? Yeah, no, it, it's concerning, but not for the reason that you said. The, the concern is it, it's related to antitrust. Just to you know, to to fill in the audience, this background is important for you to understand the answer. This case we filed in 2014. There's been tens of thousands of attorney hours spent on this case over spread over five different firms were out of pocket around $10 million in hard costs. That's money that the attorneys have paid out uh, as expenses related to the prosecuting this case. <clears throat> By inserting 
individual arbitration and class action waivers, you'd have to bring these cases one at a time for one fighter. The economics of that case no longer work. You wouldn't have firms outlaying $10 million for one fighter's case. It makes sense because we can do this on behalf of a class of 1,215. Now the economies of scale kick in and it makes sense. Firms will take on the risk and they'll do these cases. We believe sometime in 2019, uh, again, as a result of our lawsuits, the UFC started uh, inserting into the promotional agreements a class action waiver and a mandatory arbitration clause. <clears throat> It's not that we fear, you know, arbitrators or arbitration process. It's uh, on an antitrust case, you've now destroyed the economics of it going forward. Now, in our view, that's grossly unfair, particularly because they inserted the clauses at a time when there was a pending lawsuit regarding monopsony power. <laughs> Th this is, again, you know, blatant evidence to us, they are continuing to exercise monopsony power because there's no way fighters or managers would agree to this crap unless it was being forced down their throats with no choice, which is what is happening. Um, so I, I think that is going to be a, an issue that we're going to have to litigate going forward. How that plays out, I can't say. Um, the, the fairness of it to me is obvious. You you can't make it would be like me making you sign a contract. You agree you will not call the police or bring any lawsuit as I steal from you behind your back. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ludicrous. <laughs> um, you, you know, of course, the opposite side will say, well, we're not taking away their right to bring the claim. They can bring it individually. Well, that's why I explained the economics of this to you. There will be no individual antitrust case brought on behalf of one fighter. Um, the economics of it make make it to where that will never happen. Um, to, to bring our suit, and I don't know the exact amounts, but just hiring the expert economists alone, we've paid the economists millions of dollars, millions, to bring this case. You know, we're going to have to do that on, on behalf of one fighter one at a time, it will never happen. You're, you're essentially removing the only enforcement of the vast majority of antitrust cases is, is through private action. There's very little uh, governmental action. If you allow uh, a defendant who's already being sued for, <laughs> for abusing monopoly power to insert the waiver, during the pendency of the case, that's to me seems absurd. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that is something we're going to have to litigate. Okay, okay, and I, we've been going for a long time. I've gotten most of my questions off, so I appreciate so much your expertise and time because it sheds a lot of light on it and it shows the true gravity, you know, that there are real people involved in this. Cause a lot of the time in MMA, you get jokers, you know what I mean? And Matt, the manager who was a joker or this at the lowest levels. And it's good to see that this is in good hands. Todd, you got something here? I got one more. We got discovery coming up right next month, right? Discovery in the Johnson case. So that was the second follow-up case. Um, that process is starting now. We've already started the meet and confer process uh, to figure out the parameters of what the discovery is going to look like in Johnson. Um, in Lee, I believe Bulware um, left a, you know, a crack in the door that allowed either side plaintiffs or defendants to file a motion seeking additional discovery related to um, a very limited portion of the Lee case. And, and I'm, again, I'm going from memory. I, I think he was indicating he, he was inclined to deny those requests, but he at least left open the possibility that, you know, if we make some compelling argument as to why 
some third party discovery is necessary in order to resolve an issue in the Lee case, they'll at least hear it. Uh, I believe that date is October 31st. But I mean, they're going to release a lot of this stuff, right? Okay, so you, you're talking about redactions. So right. I believe that date that date I I think is is also October 31st. Um, the the judge essentially said that anything that has been filed in the case, starting back from the complaint forward, that was in redacted form, and and there's you know various reasons for that. Um, Zufo was claiming trade secret or you know confidential material. Um, things like that the, the judge pretty directly said no given the public import of this case uh, how long this case has been litigated he's going to unseal everything that has been filed in the case with the exception of personally identifiable information so if you had you know todd's phone number redact redact that out if that is address redact that out or uh some of the documents have some medical information we could we could re redact that. Everything else should be made public, and you can expect that that will occur shortly after October thirty first. I would imagine. The reason I mention this is you have this merger coming up, or you know it's already done. Basically, there could be some negative PR that comes out of this release of information. I would think, you know, that people on the board and you know, so it may not be too crazy about. I've been surprised by their disclosures, you know, thus far. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, so again, I, I, a great deal of thanks for the time um, and the detail that you gave us. Um, as a closing statement, next year at this time, you know, beginning of October of next year, this lawsuit could be wrapped up if everything goes. Even not not well if everything goes according to the way it seems to be going, like with the judges' decisions and things. So right now we're less than less than a year away from this closing. We should have a resolution one way or the other, uh, whether we go to trial or or, or settled, or um, whether the appeal is taken up on the Ninth Circuit. Um, assuming that appeal is rejected, which over eighty percent of them are. I, I agree. Yeah, no, we should have some sort of at least indication as to what the resolution is. And, and the, the reason I waffle a little bit is whatever the result, they're going to appeal. So, you know, we'd have to wait out the appeal. But but for that, no, I agree with you. Um, we're, we're, we now see the end of, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. We are now approaching. Um, there, there was years where we were just sitting, waiting, not knowing what our schedule was at all. Like nothing was happening uh, during basically the entire COVID period. Nothing happened. We just sat and waited. Um, that has now changed drastically. The, the judge fast-tracked us. He dumped an enormous amount of work on all of the attorneys on both sides in a condensed time period. Um, but it got us what we wanted what we've been asking for all along a trial date. That trial date is sort of, you know, in concrete, a flashing risk sign to Zufa. Until that trial date was set, you know, there's something nebulous in the future. Now they know when the date is. If, if we go to trial and we get a result uh, at trial uh, that starts April 9th, by statute, whatever the result whatever the award the jury awards us is tripled. So strong. So, you know, we, you've been going at this for 10 years, obviously, you know, it started out as a, you know, uh, as a lawyer, you saw something, but this has been a labor of love too. You, you know, you don't invest 10 years in stuff like this, but how are you going to feel in a year if you're actually the savior of MMA kind of thing? Like, does that make you feel, is that, Something you've thought about? Like, what goes on after the lawsuit? Like, Oh, man. So I, I started I started jiu-jitsu in 19, around 1999. I started um, as more than a fan in MMA 
right around 2003. And my, my first cases were, I did a case for Erica Montoya against King of the Cage. And then I did, I did uh, a, a case for Chris Brennan against Pride. Those were like 2003. I think, I think Chris's were like 2005, 2006. So I, I've been in this for over 20 years now as, as more than a fan. Um, the, the closest analogy I can give to people is if watch the movie Dark Waters. That, that is very, very accurate as to sort of the career development of, of me. I mean, when I said I was a real estate lawyer, that, that was not a lie. I was a real estate lawyer. Now, all of a sudden, I'm doing combat sports antitrust contingent at a firm that doesn't do any contingency and has never done antitrust. <laughs> Full time. Four years. In years. And years. Crazy. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're, you know, coming up on the end result that I sort of always knew was coming uh, is is very satisfying. But the, 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 the cost that I paid was steep. And I appreciate that. I, I'm I'm gonna wrap it up here, Todd. If you if you don't have any other questions, one thing I, I want to let you know, you know, a little personal touch. I judged Eddie Bravo against Hoyler Gracie. I was the lead judge at the table for that. <laughs> nice. So got to witness that and enjoy, you know, that moment rise uh, almost equally to, to you guys. <laughs> it was an unbelievable yeah, so, moment. So. Yeah, you you know what an upset that was. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I yeah, I, uh, look, I, I'm sitting here and the triangles apply, and Hoyler sits up and he looks out at the crowd and says, son of a bitch, filo de puta. <laughs> that's, that's my first impression of it. And then, um, what was the kid's name? Jamie Walsh? Was, was that one of the partners? Because Streaman was one of his uh, corner men, but I think Jamie Walsh, a British guy, was down there as his true corner, as Eddie. Uh -oh. And he gets up and stands, and, and the only thing you can hear in the arena is Joe Rogan off to the side going, holy shit. <laughs> it's a crazy moment. So, um, you know, you won me over when you appreciated that moment as well. I had a personal tie to it, but it is a seminal moment. It shows that you love the sport and that at the end of the day is why you, you did this to, to, to help out. So uh, I'm grateful. I wanted to get you on the record for my podcast because it's the MMA Museum podcast. I, I feel like we're trying to document important things and, and what you've done uh, for the last two decades is, you know, maybe the most important thing that's been going on behind the scenes, you know, throughout all that time, uh, combating the tentacles, <laughs> we'll call them that. So thank you very no, much, uh, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yep. No, Todd, talking to you again. Yes, sir. All righty. Thank you very much.